Every team, every topic, everywhere. This is Believe. Ich war seit Wochen auf diesen Tag und tanz vor Freude über den Asphalt. Als wär's sein Rhythmus, als gäb sein Lied. Hello and welcome to Gegenpressing, the Bundesliga podcast. This is the main show. I am your host, Manu Feit. He is Stefan Bienkowski. Stefan, how's it going? We're recording this late on a Sunday, um, which is my fault. So I apologize because I have an insane travel schedule next week. Uh, more on that later. But how are you doing, first of all? I'm not bad, Manu. Um, only thanks to the Bundesliga, I must add. Uh, I'm a little hungover. Um, I was at a kilt fitting uh, in Glasgow yesterday, which to anyone who's not Scottish or hasn't been to a Scottish wedding is basically the concept of um, the groomsmen for a wedding, which I'm one of for my good friend. Um, you get fitted for your kilts uh, maybe about six months before the wedding, um, just so you have the right sizes. Mm. Uh, and because we're Scottish, we then often turn that into a uh, excuse to go get drunk and celebrate the upcoming wedding, which is exactly what we did. So I was drinking for about 10 or 11 hours yesterday. And Ooh. luckily, um, luckily I have a nice glass of red wine in front of me, which is, you know, taking the edge off it. As they say, the hair of the dog that bit you. Mm. Uh, and of course, some tremendous Bundesliga football. Uh, and what can undoubtedly or is undoubtedly a legitimate title race in the German top flight. So yeah, I'm in a good mood despite everything that happened. Yeah. Whispered quietly. We have a title race. Um, you were of course, very, very fortunate to not watch uh, Union Berlin against Schalke. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> don't worry. I, I watched it. So we, we, we have to talk about it, I guess uh, we have tons to talk about this week. Um, so we should jump into it right after this break. This episode of the Gegen Pressing Podcast is brought to you by Bet Online. Bet Online remains your number one source for all your sports betting this season. Everything from pro and college basketball to UFC, MMA, and more. You always find the latest odds, team matchup info, player news, and game trends at Bet Online. With live betting options, free contests, and live scores for almost any sport or game imaginable. Bet online is truly the fastest and easiest way to bet all your favorite leagues and events. Head to the website today or use your mobile device to join and receive your 50% welcome bonus with your first deposit. Make sure to use the promo code BELIEVE, B L E A V, BELIEVE, to receive your rewards. BetOnline.ag, where the game starts. Yeah, Stefan, um, I guess, should we start with the Klassiker, the original Klassiker, which mm. still is a Klassiker because it's the only time Bayern Munich actually get challenged <laughs> on a regular basis by, by a club. Um, we previewed this um, last week and we sort of felt that, I think we had two different opinions going into this, right? I, I thought that Gladbach are probably still going to take points of it. You you thought that Bayern are going to smash Gladbach. I think we bo both now know with some certainty that there is death taxes and Gladbach taking points of Bayern. Um, <laughs> it, <laughs> this this game, there was so much. I mean, there, there was a ton to discuss. And uh, shall we bring in Chris first, Stefan? Or do you want to chat about what happened during the game. I think we should probably start with the contentious Opamecano decision, right? There is there is so much right there. Um, so what do you think? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, let's get Chris in on this. So um, he sent us in his an audio clip of him explaining uh, what he thought of the decision. Um, we can let listeners listen to that. Uh, Chris is obviously a qualified referee, so he obviously has a lot of authority on the matter. And then maybe you and I can jump in afterwards. Yeah, sounds good. Like for those who don't know who Chris is, uh, this is Chris Williams, who's a founding member of this podcast. You will hear a little bit more of him in the coming weeks, which is 
something really exciting. But yeah, he has been busy getting his refereeing license. And yeah, he sent us in his opinion on the Upamecano red card. Let's listen in. Stefan, Manu, hello. We must have had an extremely contentious decision this week to bring me in. And yes, did we ever. Gladbach versus Bayern saw a red card for Upamecano in just the eighth minute. The Bayern defender, a judge by referee Tobias Veltz, to have denied an obvious goal scoring opportunity, or dog so for short, for Gladbach's Alassane player. Veltz makes his decision after looking over at his assistant on the far side. From this, we can conclude that they were talking to each other on the headset as the event happened. Veltz sees up as touch a cross player's chest as a careless attempt to win the ball. This carelessness, in his eyes, results in knocking the player off his stride. Once Veltz has made this decision, the only course of action available is to issue a red card for Dogso. There's a four-point check system for Dogso. The distance between the offence and the goal, the general direction of the play, the likelihood of keeping or gaining control of the ball, and the location and number of defenders. I don't think anyone can argue that if the referee decides the contact is enough for a foul, then the outcome isn't a red card. What makes this decision very contentious is the level of contact and where Veltz has for his threshold for what constitutes a foul. Football is a contact sport and the game expects a level of contact when players vie for the ball. We've all seen grappling at corners, for example. Had this coming together happened in the centre of the pitch with players on both sides, would that level of contact, the brush on the shoulder, be given as a foul? For me, as a referee, that slight contact isn't at the threshold for what I would consider a foul. I would consider it normal football contact, but Veltz doesn't. There's a VAR check, but as the VAR in Cologne cannot offer the referee a view to disprove what he's seen, there can be no pitch side review. Was there contact? Yes. Did that contact result in a foul? Yes, according to the referee. Does the VAR have an angle to show zero contact? No. Then in this instance, the referee is not wrong in law, so there is no clear and obvious error. But what is in question is the threshold of what contact level constitutes a foul. And this is what has got people talking across the Bundesliga world after this match. Yeah, Stefan. Um, <sighs> we, we, I mean, we have a WhatsApp chat, right? Where Chris is in as well. Um, we discuss everything in that chat before we usually put it on Twitter because we're both too scared of the wrath that we can receive on social media when it comes to refereeing decisions. Um, I discussed this with Chris in great length and I st still got a lot of Bayern fans yelling at me on Twitter today and yesterday. Um, I think what I want to point out first of all when I look at this, I think it's a harsh decision without a doubt. Um, but I think it's also one that the referee quite clearly can justify, right? And I think there's a difference between saying, well, I wouldn't have given it because I think it's too harsh. But I was saying at the same time, it's not an error. And this is what this is all about, right? Um, I had people come to me and say, well, a red card should be black and white. It's not, unfortunately. Like the, pretty much the only rule in football that's black and white is offside or whether the ball has crossed the line or not, right? This is unfortunately not. And I can see how Veltz came to the conclusion that this was a foul. Um, I, I think that the way Upamecano defends that attack and the, the, the touch on the shoulder, and Veltz quite clearly states this on, he was on Doppelpass at Sport 1 this morning and, and came actually on television to explain this decision, which is, I think is, is, is quite grand from him to do so, right? And you see that quite a lot in German football. But for me personally, why I think it's a harsh, harsh decision, I don't think it's an error. And as such, I think that it was for good reason that the call stood on the field. So, yeah, what I'm trying to say is harsh decision, but justifiable. What do you think? Yeah, so, you know, as I just mentioned at the top of the show, I was obviously predisposed on Saturday, so I didn't get the chance to watch this game live. Um 
I wasn't. <laughs> I spent much of the day in a pub that didn't even have internet signals, so the whole match day passed me by. And quite luckily, I think, because I probably would have ended up fighting with people on Twitter about this <laughs> yeah. if I had watched it live. I did that for you. <laughs> <laughs> sure, sure. Uh, I saw you guys talking about it in the group chat. Uh, I still didn't even get a chance to watch it. Um, and it wasn't until Sunday morning when I was able to watch the game back in full. Um, and I watched the kind of decision made in real time and I honestly just didn't think much of it at the time. I didn't think it was controversial. I didn't think it was uh, harsh. I think what fundamentally stands out to me is that when the forward steps across the defender in this situation, the thing that stands out to me here is Upa Meccano's arm movements and the way that he almost kind of shimmies player out the way to try and get him past them. And I feel like that's really crucial to this because, you know, Chris doesn't think that's enough contact. And obviously, you know, fair enough. And he, he's, he's probably absolutely right there. But my interpretation of what happened in real time was that obviously the Gladbach striker has been very clever in the sense that he's like, as soon as I step across with Meccano and as soon as I feel him breathing down my neck, I have every right to hit the ground. And... I feel like there's also the context this is that it's Upa Meccano and you know I don't really want to kick the guy while he's down he's obviously been sent off it's caused you know barring three points but I feel like this is something we have seen time and time again from Upa Meccano where it's almost as if he feels a need to compensate for something by being almost overly physical on the pitch uh, we see it where he get, picks up stupid yellow cards um, or he goes in too harsh on strikers or goes into tight on strikers to try and be physical with them, and he often gets rolled very easily. And in this situation, I feel like his hand movements, when player kind of stepped across him, were entirely unnecessary. And I feel like a yeah. maybe more experienced or a smart defender would have thought, this guy is looking for any excuse to go down here. I need to stay well clear of him. Uh, and Dupin Meccano just doesn't do that. And in real time, it looked to me as if he does, he does make a touch on player and he does do enough to almost kind of, like I said, he almost tries to shimmy him past him so he mm. can quickly get the other side of him. Um, and then, I, you know, I saw the highlights from the YouTube highlights on the Bundesliga cha- channel. Didn't change my opinion on it either. And, you know, we discussed it with Chris and I think the point I was trying to make as well is, you know, Chris was saying there's not enough contact there. Mm-hmm. My kind of concluding point was that well if you flip the situation around there and say Upa Meccano's in possession he's in the corner of the pitch and players closing him down from behind we see this happen 10-15 times a game where a defender gets closed down by an opposing forward and he just waits until the player comes up behind him and he falls over and Mm. 9 out of 10 times the referee gives us a free kick or a foul so I'm not saying that two wrongs make a right in this situation but I'm just saying that um I don't I don't I just don't think um to me anyway in my personal opinion it didn't seem like there was too much contact there and and and, and I think fundamentally Upa Meccano gave the referee a decision to make by the way he kind of dealt with that situation I don't even think player falls on purpose I think that that contact is enough for him to fall automatically I mean these guys now run speeds of 30 kilometers an hour um not many people that listen to the show or including us too can run that speed. But imagine being on a bike and going that speed and having a little bit of contact. You'd be all over the pavement. And I, I think that is what we have to remember. He, the contact on the shoulder is enough for the upper body to fall backward a little bit. He then overcompensates to go forward, makes another step. He, he actually tries to stay on his legs and that's when he falls. So I, I I've people said to me, he's diving. I, I, I don't think he's diving. He's making another two or three steps, stumbling, and then falls. And um, Welt said this in on Dopa today, on Doppelpass, that he didn't, from his perspective, there was no obvious dive because player tried to stay on his feet to complete a goal-scoring chance, which then, of course, you know, further underlined to him that this that the, the, the contact that Upamecano caused was enough to, for player to fall. Right. 
And it was, again, this is why it's so key for referees to actually speak to the media and show them their perspective. And it was really interesting to see what that did to the circle of journalists. And they had another referee on there that, that I unfortunately forgot his name. Um, but once they got that explanation, the entire mood of this debate changed. Uh, everyone but Waldemar Hartmann, who I don't know why he's still in media, involved in media in Germany, uh, Stefan, but everyone on that circle pretty much then came to the conclusion that this was not an, a clear and obvious error. They were saying that a few of them were still saying it was harsh, but everyone agreed that it was a fault, right? Yeah. And I think that is why the, giving this refereeing um, opinion is so crucial and yeah. something like that, right? Because like the perspective of the referee, what he sees on the field is very important in that regard because he sees it live. And uh, yeah, I think, you know, honestly, again, we can debate all day long whether it was harsh or not. I'm open to that, but it was not a clear and obvious error. It was not a dive. And, you know, in that kind of situation, how many times have we seen it go the other way? Mm, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I, I, I mean, it'd be interesting to hear from some of subscribers, uh, leave comments mm -hmm. underneath to see what these, what the guys think. But I just, I just didn't think much of it at the time. I'm not sure it's that controversial. Um, maybe I, mean, I guess Bayern fans are going to be saying typical stuff and you know, kicking as well we're down. But I, yeah. I just genuinely didn't think much of it at the time when I watched it. In, in all honesty, and I think if we kind of want to just kind of now talk about maybe Bayern's performance in general, I'm not entirely sure having 11 players on the pitch would have helped either, to be honest with you. Mm, yeah, no, they were not good. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I mean, watching this in life, um, yeah, they scored one late, right, um, to make it 3-2. Mm. My prediction before the game was 2-2, and I think actually with 11 men, that would have probably been what happened. You know, mm. they were probably drawn 2-2. They really struggled with Gladbach's speed in the attack. I mean, the player situation is a good example. Mm. If Upamecano doesn't take him down there, he probably scores, right? Yeah. Um, and there was the, the free kick that led to the eventual 1-0 um, is another great example because Gladbach kind of sliced Bayern open quite easily there, right, defensively. Mm. Um, another issue that I had, and I'm really curious what you think about this, Stefan, Nagelsmann made all his substitutions ahead of the 65 minute mark, around 65 minute mark. Mm. And it was then that um, Farke reacted quite late uh, for Gladbach to make his changes. And he brings on a lot of speed. And I actually thought, and I was, I was looking over to my dad because I'm still in Munich. And so I watched this game with him. Mm. I said, like, wh why is Nagelsmann making five changes this early on? Like, what if he has to react? And also, what if he has a player out there who's tired, right? And I thought Farke was quite clever to wait quite late because he did bring on that speed that then eventually led to the third goal. Mm. And I actually, I was, you watch this back later on, right? So that mm. always gives you a little bit of a different perspective. But I'm curious what you think about that. Yeah, I must admit, I thought Nagelsmann's tactics were really odd in this game. Um, he obviously kind of started with this kind of back three that he'd hoped to play. Mm -hmm. Um which had Davies playing, you know, obviously really high up the pitch, almost as a left winger at times. Uh, and I think it was maybe Serge Gnabry who's playing on the right-hand side. Uh, and obviously Pavard, Upamecano and Daly Blind as central defenders. And then Kimmich, Gravenberg, Goretzka in the middle, like I said, and then Muller and Chupamoting up front. And the weird thing is, once Bayern went down to 10 men, he still tried to persevere with this back three um and but you know obviously then Cancelo came on for Thomas Muller but what this mm. kind of led to was this kind of weird 3-3-3 three, three, three formation um and i think quite crucially it also meant that you know it, it, <laughs> it was Daily Blind and Benjamin Pavard the two kind of key central defenders at times and they were just overrun constantly by that gladback uh, team on their counter attacks. You know, I think I said to you after the game that poor Dilly Blind looked about two hundred years old after this game because mm. it, you know he just did not he did not like playing that high line. He didn't feel look, look comfortable with it at all. I thought Hoffman had a really good game. Stindo really in his element there, where you can just kind of ping balls, make passes, score goals with a lot of space there. And I think the other problem with this kind of 3-3-3 three, three, three formation is that it puts so much emphasis on those midfielders to kind of step up and become these kind of all-round playmakers and defence midfielders, if you want to call them that. 
But, you know, as we kind of touched on on the reaction pod, I think it was a reaction pod to the, the PSG game. Mm-hmm. There's just something going on with Yosha Kimmich and Leon Goretzka right now. And they just don't really look like themselves at the moment. Um, yeah. I was kind of looking at the excellent Mark Stats um, account that I've referenced a few times now this week um, or this season who puts together some really great kind of stats um, bundles after the game. So you can definitely find him on Twitter. It's at Mar- Mark Stats Bot. Uh, and one of the things he pulls together is a kind of line, a graph of um, all the players on the pitch and which ones basically progress the ball the most up the pitch either through passing or through dribbling Mm. and as you would expect you know Davies was miles ahead for Bayern in terms of carrying the ball in terms of dribbling Um, but where you would maybe expect Joshua Kimmich or Goretzka to be key players kind of pinging the passes they're they're actually quite far behind to be honest with you Uh, and Daily Blind ended up being the kind of key player there who was trying to pull out the passes so there's something not quite right about this Bayern team. We talked about this after the PSG game. I, you know, I was convinced that it really wasn't a good performance from Bayern, despite the result. Um, and this game also just felt like another match in which half those players just were not clicking whatsoever. You know, I actually thought Davies played quite well for the most part in this game. Uh, mm-hmm. It's maybe the best I've seen yeah. him so far, just because he kind of had that free role. Um, but on the whole, um, you know, I thought. Kimmich and Goreska were continue our problem. Benjamin Pavard, again, second game running, I think, was a real liability in defence. Uh, I actually thought Jan Sommer actually had quite a poor game, to be honest, as well. Mm-hmm. Um, and, yeah, I don't know. It was it's, it's just, it was a really troubling game for Bayern, and I can imagine it would drive Julian Nagelsmann absolutely bonkers when he'd watched it back. Well, it did drive him up the bonkers. He went into the refereeing room and had a man-to-man discussion with the referee and stormed out of the refereeing room and um, called, s- screamed something of the on the lines of, uh, what did he say? Um, not lazy pack, soft pack. Um, the DFB has now opened an investigation against Nagelsmann. Uh, Vels was quick to point out that he didn't say anything agrarious um, against him in the room, that it was a man-to-man discussion on yeah. eye level. Mm. Um, but I guess there is something coming uh, for Nagelsmann. But uh, yeah, I, I mean, I agree with every point that you're making here because they just don't look complete at the moment. Mm. And they have now what dropped, what was six, nine points mm. the second half of the season. Um, Dortmund is now completely back in the title race. Yeah, Union Berlin stumbled today. They are even on points. Freiburg are just points, three points behind them. Um, it's so very tight. I mean, you look even down further down. Frankfurt are back in it. Leipzig are still in it. Um, Bayern Munich were five points ahead of second place going in this World Cup break. Mm. And this is quite the meltdown in terms, in terms of point collected. And... I, I feel like this is not necessarily... I mean, I just don't see them being able to put together a run of five or six wins this year. Mm. Yeah. I mean, I, I haven't really been able to have a chance to really dig into the underlying stats as to what's mm. been going on since the turn of the years. Perhaps something I'll, I'll look at from a newsletter this week. But just anecdotally, watching Bayern now, at this point in the season, every three or four days, I'm, I'm kind of drawn to the idea that <laughs> there are problems across this team at the moment you know yep. it's not like um it's not like maybe some of the teams in this division where you know they're very solid defensively but they can't quite get their attack going or they're very good offensively but they've still got holes in defense if you kind of look across this whole Bayern team there's compromises there are players out of form there's tactical well, what Nagelsmann would probably say is he's maybe trying to use his tactics to compensate for maybe some poor, poor performances. I mean, you know, obviously mm. defensively, the key thing there is that Upa Meccano got injured, or uh, sorry, got sent off, but that maybe overshadows from the fact that Blind and Pavard looked terrible together, I thought. Looked very slow together. Um, Jan Sommer, uh, I thought, wasn't very good in goals. But you've also, so does that, if that defence is just kind of still kind of struggling to to really kind of nail down what it wants to be. 
as I mentioned in midfield, you've got the two key that players there who are supposed to be the kind of match winning, you know, Bayern Munich stalwart examples for the rest of the squad in Kimmich and Goretzka. Both of them completely off it this season for one reason or another. And then you go to attack where not only they're relying on Chupa Moting, who with the best of intentions uh, continues to dumbfound his critics and anyone who had lesser expectations on him. But even despite that, Chupa Moting cannot be the talisman at Bayern Munich. He cannot be the number nine for this team. Uh, if it wants mm. to go places. And the problem there as well is that the supporting cast in that team, in attack, your Serge Gnabry's, your Leroy Sané's, um, they're not really kind of hitting their stride either. And it feels like this team's just kind of waiting around for Sadio Mane to return and to try and do something. Cause, so it's, it's it just feels like there's issues all over this team. And whether or not that's Nagelsmann's fault or the fact that maybe there's some players there who maybe should have been moved on instead of being offered extended contracts, I guess when we have to wait and see to the end of the season. But I'm sure that's something that Oliver Kahn's probably thinking about right now as to where the problems are and and what the source of those problems are. Mm, yeah, my final thought before we do move on um, is that I think there's a lot of key players that have left yeah. Um, in in recent years, um, that's hard to compensate. David Alaba, right? Robert Lewandowski now. Manuel Neuer is now injured. Thomas Müller is aging. Things do come to an end. Hmm. And maybe we're seeing the beginning of it. I, I, I don't know. I mean, it could be different in five, four or five weeks, but it does feel a little bit like the torch is now being passed on and maybe the new generation isn't as quite as far as we thought. Um, mm. And that is good news for the rest of the league, I think, because it was going to happen eventually. It happens always, you know. Uh, Juventus Turin at some point passed the torch and more. <laughs> but <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't think Bayern is going to do a Juventus. But um, you know, it it does. Everything does end at some point, you know. Um, I mean, you Scottish, even Celtic, at some point when they had that run, it ended at some mm. point, right? Um, mm. So maybe this is what we're seeing. Um, it's it's really interesting. Let's talk about the teams chasing. And Union Berlin could have gone first today. Hmm. And I, you were very fortunate that you missed this game, Stefan. <laughs> 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 so uh, back to back story here. I went for the first time in four years. I didn't actually realize it was four years. I went to 1860 today um, because I'm, I'm writing a sub stack on the club, right? Mm. Uh, so uh, I went back and um, got a press card and all that and spent some time with the club. And um, I have an app where you track a ground hopping app. And actually, as I opened it to like lock in that I'm going to the 1860 game, it reminded me that I have been last on this day four years ago. I watched that game. It was horrible. They lost 3-0 to a small club called Fail. I mm-hmm. thought I couldn't possibly watch a worse game today. And then I did. <laughs> I came home and I watched Union Berlin against Schalke. And it was the worst 90 minutes of football I have seen this season, Stefan. It was mm-hmm. atrocious. And I think part of it is, I think there was quite a lot of rotation with Union Berlin. You could tell that their the second guard isn't quite ready. I mean, Urs Fischer did bring on the likes of Geraldo Becker and Jordan. It did get better. Jordan actually missed a sitter mm. to make it 1-0. And uh, the XG, and this is from the DFL, I think um, I, I maybe you want to double-check that XG with the, the one that you use. But um, the XG, according to DFL, was 0.95 to 0.30. Mm. Um, you know, and yeah, maybe Union would have deserved to win this game 1-0. Uh, they did it not. Um, but it was just, it was an awful performance. Um, Schalke is just a really hard team to watch. They just defend, defend, defend. Um, this is their fourth draw, fourth zero zero draw in a row now, which is a record apparently. Hmm. Um, but you know, yes, a point for Union Berlin. They had 43 points now. I mean, like for them, of course, this is a success, but boy, it was a hard watch. Um, and maybe like them not going first is a good thing in some ways, I think, because you wonder how they're playing Bayern Munich next in Munich, right? Um, mm. I wonder if that would have actually suited them. Yeah. No, like you said, I didn't get to watch this game, so I'm afraid I can't add so much. But what I would like to do is maybe shine a light on Schalke to an extent here, just because that's the fourth clean sheet in a row in the Bundesliga. Right. And That's the positive. <laughs> yeah, well, exactly. Yeah, you, you know, you say it was a boring, drab, 
uneventful game, but that's exactly what Schalke fans yeah. would have wanted, you know. And they are kind of pulling together this kind of secret covert run of form. It's not the most exciting run of form in the world. It's certainly not going to get them on any kind of highlights reels, but it's now four draws from four. And actually, you know, I had a quick look at the underlying stats and it's quite interesting because, you know, as you said, um, Union's XG for that for this game is 0 0.95, which is very low. Um, mm. And it's also half what uh, opponents of Schalke have averaged against them in the Bundesliga this season. Um and even just kind of going back to these now that that this 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 run of four games, the interesting thing to me that stands out is if you kind of look at this, how many shots on target, um, their last four opponents have had, um, Cologne in the nil nil draw didn't have a single shot on target, mm. Gladbach in the nil in their nil nil draw only had four shots on target, and Wolfsburg last week only had two shots on target, um, and actually their average. Uh, for the season ahead uh, or since the, uh, before the turn of the year, so in the Hinrunda in the first half of the season, um, mm. opponents averaged five shots on target per game uh, mm. in 2022. So they're, they are obviously putting in the hard yards there. They're obviously getting far better defensively. Yeah. Um, and so basically, you know, that they're, they're, they are slowly but surely clawing away at the chances that they, that, that they would give teams. And Yes, it doesn't make for great football, and yes, nope. Union Berlin fans would be upset about it, but it is, there are kind of shoots of hope, there's shoots of good, of, 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 of progress being made at Schalke there, at least in a defensive sense. Yeah, it's, it's really difficult to watch, and I think Union Berlin um, do better against teams that actually play football, right? Mm. Because essentially, they do to the opponents what Schalke did to them, just at a higher level with a bit more of attacking progress. Yeah, exactly. And I think that that is just, that's what happened here because Schalke was like, well, you guys go play football. Good yeah. luck because we know you can't, right? <laughs> Here's the ball. Have fun. We're just going to stand with 11 guys behind the ball and um, every once in a while go for a counterattack. And if we get a point at the, at the first array, we're going to be A-OK -okay with that. And that's that's what this game looked like. It was yeah. a really difficult watch. Um, it did get back better when Becker and Jordan came on, and Jordan did have a chance that I thought he had had to put away, um, but he didn't. And yeah, here we are. I mean, I don't want to dwell too long on this game because it was a very, very difficult watch. I think, though, maybe to come to a conclusion here, and we're going to talk, of course, talk about this later this week. Um, I think that Union Berlin will be happier to play a team like Bayern Munich. As crazy yeah. as downs, because Bayern Munich will essentially do, like, they can do to Bayern Munich what Schalke did to them. Yes, exactly. Um, I think, uh, I, yeah, I mean, we've talked about this quite some time now on this podcast, but the rise of Union Berlin, and I think there's a number of things behind it, especially off the pitch, where there's a lot of smart mm -hmm. people doing a lot of smart work there. But if you want to boil it down to just tactics on the pitch, Union's success is in part because they chose to play a different style of football from the kind of orthodox yep. tactics of the Bundesliga, which this podcast is named after. Uh, and as I've, as I've said in the past, gigging pressing is a great tactic if you're the best team in the league. But if you're a mid-table side with many, a number of average players and perhaps not very good at defending, it leaves you wide open. And it means big teams like Bayern can pick you off. And Union Berlin can pick these teams off as well because they run around a lot. They pr they press very high. And as long as Union can kind of deal with that pressure, they can then counterattack very coherently, very efficiently. And if they're, if they're just good defensively, it gives them a leg up, I think, tactically over a lot of teams in the division. So it'll be interesting to see if Schalke can kind of have perhaps taken something from that. Mm. Uh, and are looking to maybe apply it to their own situation, but yeah, as you said, maybe we've, we've maybe already shined far too much light on this drab nil nil game. Oh God, yeah. Okay, let's move on from it. Um, <laughs> <laughs> let's go to some a game that was actually fun to watch, and that's Dortmund. Dortmund didn't Dortmund, Stefan. They didn't Dortmund. They almost Dortmund, but they didn't Dortmund in the end. Mm, yeah, they pick up all three points and close that gap to Bayern Munich finally. Um, it was a huge gap. I think it was eight points 
right? Going into mm -hmm. the World Cup break, and now they're even. And eight games out of eight won, second half of the season so far. That includes the Champions League games, that includes the Cup, of course. Mm -hmm. um, they are in tremendous form. Marco Reus with a wonderful free kick to essentially seal this game, right? Make mm -hmm. it 3-1, and then they are Bino getting some brand combined to make it 4-1 in the end. Um, but Dortmund look like the real deal in a lot of ways. And I think what makes them dangerous at the moment, and we've touched on this already in, in previous shows, is that is they seem to have real depth going on right now. Um, there's pieces coming on and off the field and the team doesn't doesn't get weaker. Um, I feel Marco Reus came on, had a fantastic game, right? And there was some controversy um, after the Chelsea game that he didn't feature in. Um, and I, it almost seemed like it it kind of spurned it on to come up with a performance like he did today. Mm. Um, I am afraid to say this, Stefan, but I think Dortmund are for real. <laughs> they were very, very impressive. There's no doubt about it. Not actually in terms of um, the overall game performance itself, because I actually think they, if you actually kind of look at like the XG timeline of the match, um, mm. obviously they pick up two early goals and then it gets very drab very quickly after that which I guess is just kind of indicative, indicative of you know a team who scored two goals and it just seems to be human nature and something we see in football over and over again that you know it's, 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 it's that old line that a 2-0 lead is the most dangerous you know um, situation in football because complacency yeah. starts to drop in and then obviously when Hertha pull one back that's when you start to worry like oh right well this is Dortmund they're going to be Dortmund mm -hmm. But the key thing is, I think, and we've talked about this on the show um, again in, in recent weeks, especially since the turn of the year, that Terzic has this kind of a real bounty of attacking options and whether or not he actually gets the tactics spot on or whether or not he gets the player selection spot on most weeks, the fact that it gets about the hour mark and he can start bringing on three or four outstanding players and just kind of throw them on and say right I need you guys to just throw everything out of this team and it and so far it's worked very very well yeah. um, I mean you're absolutely right if you kind of look at that start 11 that Dortmund put out not only was it missing a number of the key players who are obviously rested ahead of the second leg against Chelsea mm -hmm. uh, you know obviously Sebastian Haller was out Guerra was out uh, Bellingham was out uh, Nicolas Sula was out and not only that but without Haller in that team and without Modeste in that team, it meant that they kind of had reverted back to that pre-system that they played before the winter break, where they didn't have a number nine. And I've kind of talked about this in the show recent weeks, what newsletter mm. was on a few weeks ago, in the sense that the real turnaround in form has been down to the fact that they've got they've suddenly got this target man up front. So Daniel Malin comes in, and even though I didn't actually think the tactics worked tremendously well, um, the fact that, you know, I mean, Adeyemi's, or well, actually, Daniel Malin's goal, I guess, is what person we describe it, came about from some truly outstanding individual skill from Adeyemi. Um, to the extent that he runs so fast that he pulls a muscle in doing so mm. uh, to help Malin score his first goal in no idea how long it's been, maybe four or five months. Um, but I think the key thing from that is not so much the first two goals, it's the fact that they were able to bring on um, players in the second half, and and then you know obviously buying um, Bellingham comes on the 65th minute, Haller comes on the 66th minute, and again if you kind of look at the kind of XG kind of timeline, you see that after these kind of moments, that's when Dortmund's XG starts to start ticking upwards again, yeah. and and even as you said, the fact that Marco Royce didn't even play in midweek but was able to start in this game looked extremely fresh. He scores a really pivotal free kick just when it was maybe. Hints that maybe Hertha were going to grab a late equaliser. Um, it, it it just goes to show, I think, and that and you know, this is what I tweeted after the game that where last season where Dortmund were this kind of very flawed one man team, in the sense that Haaland scored a bucket load of goals, but the team itself never played very well, and actually the club itself never moved forward with him. I kind of said at the time that despite having Haaland in that team, he didn't really move the dial for them at all in terms of getting closer to Bayern. Um, yeah. they've now kind of gone full circle in that regard and I think they now finally have found a way to replace Haaland in a sense not with any one player it's not like Sebastian Haller's replaced him or Bayern Gittins or Marco Royce or Gio Reyna or whoever 
Terzic has just found this great collective group of attacking players and it's a credit to his kind of man management that he's got them playing all extremely well. They're all running through brick walls for him. Even guys like Daniel Malin, who Terzic said in midweek that, you know, he was asked why he hasn't played recently and he kind of had to say, in fact, maybe it might not have been midweek, it might have been last weekend actually. He's like, look... Mm. He has to perform in training. He might get game time. But the fact that he can come into that team and run his socks off is a testament to Terzic's man management. And if you want to compare it to the situation we were just talking about at Bayern Munich, where Nagelsmann can't seem to find three good players in form at the moment across his whole team, it shows the real kind of value in a squad that believes in their head coach at the moment. And that's, I think, exactly what Dortmund are. Well, the big question then is, is, is that enough, right? I mean, we were admittedly quite critical of Eden Terzic and the work that mm. was done in the first half of the season. Um, tactically, he seems to have improved quite a bit. There was, I mean, we have to remember this too, going into the World Cup break, there were rumors that Dortmund might replace him. Mm. Um, you know, I mean, this is not that long ago. And so you wonder what happened in that World Cup break that turned this team into this. Mm. Right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, I think probably the easiest answer there is simply that these players have just kind of settled in. Uh, mm. He's he's kind of got... Um, he's, he had certain tactics, he had a certain system, maybe he has a certain way of doing training and, 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 and just managing that squad. And after like six months or something... Everyone's now kind of singing from the same hymn sheet. They they know where they stand with Terzic. They know what they have to do to play games, and the players themselves are, have all linked up very well with each other. I think you can also certainly point to the fact that Sebastian Haller's now back in that team, who, yeah. you know, lest we forget, is an outstanding European striker. So he obviously mm. makes a big difference regardless. And he's also the kind of striker who makes the players around him better. So he's just it's just a win win having him in that team. Uh, but then you've also got guys like Bayern Gittins coming in there, I think, um, who offers yeah. just this incredible kind of impetus of attacking speed and influence and, and belief, which probably kind of galvanizes the whole team there. So we're kind of going to have to wait and see how they do against some of the better teams in the division. Um, despite having this kind of, you know, run of form, um, really since obviously this, the start of the year, you can't really point to the teams that they have beaten in that run as saying they're the very best. You know, of course they played Bayer Leverkusen and beat them. Uh, I didn't think they played particularly well in that game. They were thought quite lucky to win that match. They played Freiburg, who I know traditionally are a very solid team in the Bundesliga, but they this season have really struggled when it came up against the big teams. And of course, they're playing Chelsea in the Champions League. They pick up a win in that game, but we're talking about Chelsea side who are kind of imploding and, if I'm not mistaken, actually lost the weekend to Southampton, I think. so. And there's rumours that they might sack Potter. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So it'll be interesting to see what they do, uh, you know, or, or how far this can go because yeah. they've got Hoffenheim next weekend, which you would think is a kind of another easier fixture, but then they have Leipzig. Uh uh, on the 3rd of March and I think that will be probably the real test of mm. uh, where, where this Dortmund team is right now but so far so good and it has made the, it is making the Bundesliga tremendous fun to watch yeah I mean I was going to ask you this um, are we allowed to say it? is there a title <laughs> race? is it for real? well since we have three teams on the same points uh, at the top of the table I think we kind of have to say it yeah, I'm just not sure I'm willing to, to say who's in it just yet. <laughs> I, I think the reason why I am saying we have a title race is that first to sixth is only five points. Hmm. And yeah. that makes that makes it, in my opinion, a title race because Bayern has to look around the, or have to look over their shoulder now. And even if one of those teams stumble, someone else might come up right this was mm. this is a, this weekend is a good example Union Berlin stumbled um but yet someone's still closed the gap mm. right um and that's why I think it's a real title race <laughs> yeah no I mean you're absolutely right I think I think it doesn't even really I mean we could sit and argue all night as to whether this Dortmund team have it in them to go to distance but you're absolutely right in saying the first and most important thing here to bear in mind is that Bayern in this current 
situation just seem incapable of picking up maximum points week in week out seem incapable of really grinding out results like they have done in recent seasons and whether it's Dortmund whether it's Union whether it's someone like a Leipzig or a Frankfurt kind of getting a second wind and coming back into it then you're absolutely right it's impossible to say there isn't a title race because Bayern aren't just they, they can't just say we'll do one better than Dortmund because there's actually three or four teams in it there so yeah Definitely, I'm not. I'm still not really willing to say, you know, um, it's a good old title race between Dortmund and Bayern just yet. But no. there's no doubt that the rest of the league is making Bayern uh, work for their points this season, and it's keeping things very tight at the top of the table. I think what's happening, and that's my final point, is I think the league overall has closed the gap, mm. and this is why Bayern are struggling. And Bayern have helped close the gap because they're not as good as they used to be. Mm. So it's kind yeah. of like both sides, right? If that makes sense. Yeah. Um, and, and that's why it's interesting. You know, Bayern aren't as good as they usually are and the rest of the league is just a little bit better. And that's what you get. Um, and it's great because we need it. This league desperately, desperately, desperately needs this. It mm. needs a storyline that's not Bayern running away with the title. Um, and I know Bayern fans are not going to be happy about this. And I know I had lots of mentions in my on my Twitter saying that we are against Bayern because we don't like Bayern Munich and all that. Um, no, that's not what this is about. We're like, we like this league and we want this league to do well. And you know, the best thing for this league, and this includes Bayern Munich is for Bayern Munich, not to win the title this year. Hmm. That sounds harsh, but it's true. <laughs> and yeah, this, this storyline is great. Absolutely. And long may it continue. And hopefully, you're right, we'll have a new champion come May because um, I think it would be best for German football. But there's a lot of football left to play between now and then. As you say, Munich, a lot of water is going to run down the Isar until then. So um, <laughs> <laughs> flow down the Isar, I guess. Yeah. Uh, anyways, as always, this show is brought to you by Bet Online. I want to make some programming notes. There's going to be a couple different voices this week, right, Stefan? We're going to have... Mm-hmm. Chris on for the Champions League reaction pod. Um, we're going to still trying to figure out what we're going to do for the transfer show because mm-hmm. I am for Transfermarkt in uh, New York and LA um, this week, which makes it difficult to record all four shows. There will be a newsletter. I can promise you that. Um, mm-hmm. So don't worry about that. It's just podcasts might come out at different times with different voices. That's all I'm saying. Mm. Yeah, exactly. So we'll keep you guys up to date. Uh, Watch this space. (laughs) Exactly. Well, thanks again for listening. Until next time, auf Wiedersehen. Thank you for listening to Believe. You can show support to your host by subscribing to the show and giving us a five-star rating on your preferred platform. Check us out at Believe.com and search for B-L-E-A-V on YouTube.